right, well, good afternoon. Thank you to everyone for taking time out of your Friday in the summertime to come hang out with me. That is something that I still can't get over. I can't believe it's an overflow crowd. Thank you so much for being here. Students in the back, waving to you. I talked to you this morning. Uh, thank you, everyone, for being here. Thank you to Miss Wendy McCaw <laughs> for the round table. We really appreciate it. She is, of course, a longtime supporter of Young America's Foundation. Um, and also, I wanted to, uh, Mr. Rodriguez, let you know that although a lot of people wear those Che Guevara t-shirts, when I was in college, my mother sent me an anti-Che Guevara t-shirt that I regularly wore to my Latin American studies course. Uh, <laughs> You can imagine how well that went over, specifically after I, w I wore it, particularly when they would start, you know, boosting Shay. I would wear it on the same days. I knew that that was in the, the lesson plan. So it was, it was great. Um, I want to start off today by first thanking Young America's Foundation for, of course, having me here today. You know, when they say that I was inspired to do what I'm doing now um, as a result of attending a conference here in 2008, it's absolutely true. Um, Young America's Foundation really does change the lives of students, especially when they're uh, constantly in a hostile environment on their college campuses. Uh, what Young America's Foundation provides in terms of tools and mentorship for people is extremely important. And I can tell you the work that they do uh, really has an impact. You know, living in Washington, D.C. now and seeing all of the graduates of Young America's Foundation's programs working in, in policy positions or in media really making a difference um, really just proves how important your support is and how important this organization has been uh, for years, but especially now in, in the modern age. Um, so obviously I'm here today to talk about my latest book, Assault and Flattery, and I'm going to start by addressing how utterly absurd it is that the left is portrayed as the champions of women. Um, you know, every book comes from an idea or a moment, and I definitely had a few of those moments leading up to the write-up of this book. The first came in February of 2012 when Nancy Pelosi invited 30-year-old 30 30 Georgetown Law student Sandra Fluck to testify on Capitol Hill about why taxpayers should foot the bill for her contraception. And at the time, the, you know, the friends in, in the media, she was portrayed as a young woman in her early 20s. But that wasn't true. She had been well into her adult years for a decade before making her statements on Capitol Hill. Now, my office is in Roslyn, Virginia, which is right across the river from Georgetown University, where Miss Sandra went to law school. And after listening to her testimony, I looked across the river in disbelief and just thought, you know, how is it at my age, which was 23 at the time of her testimony, as a young professional working hard to pull a paycheck and to pay my own bills, right, this 30-year-old woman wants me as a taxpayer to pay for anything other than my own medical bills, my own needs, and anything else that I think that I should be having in my life. I was in disbelief. I, I just couldn't believe that, you know, why was it that $9 a month was really that big of a deal for, for a strong, independent woman to come up with? And, you know, the answer to this was that the left obviously likes to uphold people who simply pass responsibility for their actions onto others, which is why I wasn't surprised when Sandra Fluck was upheld as a hero and then, of course, put out on the 2012 campaign trail. And then another moment that led up to the writing of this book came when I was sitting at the 2012 DNC convention in Charlotte, North Carolina. And my job as a reporter and a journalist is to sit through lots of different speeches. And for hours and days, I'd been listening to speech after speech about Mitt Romney's war on women, how conservatives hate women. And not only did Bill Clinton speak on the same night <laughs> that Sandra Fluck spoke, but the DNC honored a man that Ann Coulter describes as having the only confirmed kill in the war on women. The TV cameras didn't catch this because it was during a break, but because I was there, I did. In between speakers, the DNC played a seven-minute seven minute long glorious tribute video to none other than Ted Kennedy. Reminder, they're complaining about the war on women. Uh, so as if that wasn't bad enough, they plastered the words Women's Rights Champion in all capital letters across the screen of the video that they were playing in this arena. It was pretty amazing, actually. 
And uh, for some reason, they skipped over one of the most important and iconic moments of his life, the time when he drove drunk off a bridge, wandered away, and left a 28-year-old loyal campaign staffer who happened to be a woman to die in his car. No one dared to utter the words Chappaquiddick that night. They weren't going to talk about it in the arena, and they certainly weren't going to talk about it in the media. But I sure had plans to talk about it later that night. <laughs> you know, luckily at this point, Piers Morgan still had a show. So um, I was booked on a political panel for Piers Morgan's show that night. And I was on with, uh, booked to be on with Piers Morgan, obviously. My friend Richard Grinnell, who served as one of Mitt Romney's uh, national security advisors and, of course, has worked for the UN. Hillary Rosen, who is the woman who famously said that Ann Romney has never worked a day in her life, and Van Jones, who is a self-appointed communist. So before sitting on set, I was hoping, just hoping, that Piers Morgan would bring up Ted Kennedy, because it would be my moment. And thankfully, that moment came. And in this video that they played during the back to the convention for a sec, they showed Mitt Romney debating Ted Kennedy when Mitt Romney was challenging him for a seat back in the 90s. And Romney said in this debate, and that was featured in the video, that he was pro-choice. Obviously, he has since changed his position. That didn't stop Piers Morgan from asking me, Katie, did it make you uncomfortable hearing Mitt Romney espousing the joys of being pro-choice? And I just responded and said, you know, you know, you know what made me uncomfortable, Piers? That at a convention that claims to be fighting the war on women, that they would play a lengthy seven-minute video, a tribute to a man who left a woman to drown in his car. <laughs> so after that, the panel exploded. You know, it was like, oh, we can't bring up Chappaquiddick. No way, you know, no way. We can talk about how Mitt Romney bullied a kid when he was 13, but we're not going to talk about what happened uh, with Ted Kennedy. So Hillary Rosen, you know, staunch defender, uh, despite claiming there's a war on women, immediately yelled, oh, come on. Piers Morgan on air said that my comment was below the belt. Uh, <laughs> so I'm just like, all right, whatever. And so then during the commercial break, Hillary Rosen turned to me and said, I think what you said was disgusting, to which I responded, I think what he did was disgusting. <laughs> But you know, to, to, on a serious note, you know, Ted Kennedy is is portrayed as this perfect example of how the left is supposed to behave, right? And he's he really is a false hero, but he isn't the only false hero that the left has has portrayed in the media, as if there's a difference portrayed for liberals to look up to. Um, Hillary Clinton is also one of those people. Um, and most things, most people don't know really about Hillary Clinton's real record because on college campuses, she's portrayed as the ultimate female figure who provides a glowing example for women everywhere. The fact is that she doesn't, and her underreported legacy is one of defending rapists and sexual predators. And no, I'm not just talking about her husband, Bill Clinton. <laughs> Bravo. Bravo. <laughs> you okay over there? You all right? <laughs> So to give you a little bit of evidence of this, you know, last month, audio of Hillary Clinton gleefully defending a child rapist was published by the Washington Free Beacon. To give you, to give you a little backstory on this, in 1975, during her time as an attorney, Hillary Clinton took on the case of Tom and Al Thomas Alfred Taylor, a man who brutally raped a 12-year-old girl at the age of 41. Clinton said that she thought Taylor was guilty. And the issue isn't her defense of the accused. After all, this is America, and even the worst of the worst in our society get their day in court and are entitled to an attorney. Instead, the issue is Clinton's behavior after getting Taylor out of a lengthy sentence for his crime when she thought he was guilty. He served less than one year in prison. This is what they reported, quote, describing the events almost a decade after they had occurred, Clinton struck a casual and complacent attitude toward her client in the trial rape for a minor. I had, to take, I had him take a polygraph, Clinton said, which he passed, which forever destroyed my faith in polygraphs, and then she started laughing. You can hear her several points during this audio laughing um, and saying that, oh, the crime, the crime lab lost all of the evidence. 